It's 2025, and heart attacks are no longer the leading cause of death in the United States. So, what does the future look like? Well, in 2027, a study in the Journal of Cardioprotection and Comfort Foods finds that visceral and subcutaneous fat dampen sudden shifts in intrathoracic pressure, acting like insulation. In lean individuals, abrupt spikes in blood pressure during emotional events, such as arguing about cryptocurrency, causes coronary plaques to rupture. In obese individuals, the pressure wave is absorbed and slowed by thick adipose lover layers before it ever reaches the coronary arteries. Result, no rupture, no heart attack. Wow, your Gary Brecca is showing. <laughs> yeah, uh, ChatGPT completely made that up. Uh, mechanistic speculation about why obesity has fallen, or rather why obesity has risen and deaths from heart attacks have fallen. So don't trust everything you read from AI or Gary Brecca. As you can tell, we've promised to be less sarcastic on this podcast. And that's why we've gotten it all out of our system within the first 60 seconds. Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach to health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette, and this is James O'Hara, my co-host. And in all seriousness, we will not be 100% serious the rest of the podcast, but we will try to make it very clear when we are. We reserve the right to have fun as we podcast and give you tools. Otherwise, nobody would listen. People who are usually happy about our sarcasm enjoy a bit of tone, but we do want to make it very clear. So we'll be dinging the sarcasm bell when we need to. And I do think it is interesting to see what ChatGPT says about many health topics, including this one. You know, you asked it to come up with a fictitious example from a clinical journal article, and I asked it to come up with real examples. So we'll post some of the real examples here, including the chart that clearly demonstrates that as obesity rates have risen, heart attack rates have fallen. So clearly this is causation or is it correlation? Yeah, people will like to do this on social media. They'll superimpose some factor uh, like seed oil consumption and obesity. And you could do the same thing with when the Rubik's Cube was invented. You know, all mm -hmm. these things that happen about the same time are not necessarily correlated. But I think this is sort of a uh, beacon of hope, right? Because it's not necessarily that less people are having heart attacks in terms of absolute numbers because our population is larger now, but less people are dying from those heart attacks. We're getting better at saving people and mm -hmm. things like the symptom awareness uh, of heart attacks or strokes, which you think of as ASCVD, kind of under that bucket. So I've seen a lot of misleading headlines that are saying mm -hmm. like heart disease no longer the number one killer mm -hmm. and sure if you're referring specifically to an acute heart attack correct then that's accurate but when i think about heart disease i think about three main buckets so the uh, arterial system right the vascular side i think of the electrical system and then i think of the structure so things like the valves and the chambers um, whether those are enlarged, whether those are pumping properly, and then, of course, you need the electrical conduction system to make that all happen. So, uh, interestingly, we're seeing some rises in things that are not acute heart attacks, and it's surprising. It may all lead back to a common cause, but we'll get into that more. What is the leading cause now? What's taken the number one spot? Um, yeah, with, uh, like, general heart attack deaths, um, the congestive heart failure is not the most common cause of death, but uh, it's one of those things where is it the primary or the secondary cause of death? So perhaps a better title would be heart attacks are not the most leading primary cause of death today, or we might be slightly better at categorizing causes of death now versus in 1960, 1970. The actual journal article, link in the description below from the Journal of the American Heart Association um, notes that things like congestive heart disease or structural heart disease, you know, expanded chambers, more trouble pumping is a cause, which is often secondary to ischemic heart disease. And things like electrical heart disease are also much more common. In fact, um, one study found a 400% increase in um, 
a fatal arrhythmia being the primary cause of death. So heart pathology is still the most leading cause of death. Yeah, it still leads back to, I think you could just as equally argue that the title could be plaque in the arteries is still the leading contributor to death. So ischemic heart disease, you know, you take a look at the word ischemia there, it's a lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen to the Mm -hmm. tissue. How does that happen? Generally, it's plaque in the arteries that's limiting that. And then Mm -hmm. downstream, that leads to heart failure. In fact, a lot of these things, like it's like all roads lead to heart failure, right? Yep. Heart failure is very common after a heart attack, so you survive it, you get a stent put in, still a large percentage of those patients are going to go on to develop heart failure. Mm -hmm. And I mean... The rates are getting better. There are better drugs now, but like statins, you know, your five-year mortality is not great for um, heart failure and, and survival. Yeah, in all seriousness, statins are not particularly great for heart failure. You know, you're thinking about ACEs and ARBs and even um, specific beta blockers. And we could probably insert the meme here so we don't lose people's attention. The Scooby-Doo meme, where hey, we found the culprit. Let's see who it really is. And then you take the mask off the ghost. And the, it's still a heart underneath. Yeah. It's not it's heart still disease. The heart. It's a different kind of heart disease. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we'll make that meme the thumbnail for this video as well. Yeah. But I think the most interesting thing to me here was the arrhythmia. And I guess before we talk about that specifically, I mean, the ways people could, so that they are convinced that they're on a good plan, they're not going to die of let's say coronary artery disease, let's say they've had their imaging done and they have no soft plaque, no calcified plaque, and they're thinking, Mm -hmm. well, how do I avoid heart failure? Or how do I avoid, maybe they don't know what ischemic heart disease is, but they want to avoid those things. So what are the risk factors you're thinking about? Are they very different than what you're thinking about for an acute MI? Definitely. Yeah. People can comment below what they think the most leading cause of arrhythmia and fatal arrhythmia is, especially in young, healthy people. Maybe something that started around the same time this study came out. Did this study come out in 2020 or 1970? Because there's a JAB that started around the 60s and 70s, the the, uh, anabolic JAB, right? Anabolic jab. Yeah, baseball players. Yep, syringe emoji in the comments if you think that that's a contributor. Yeah, so we're looking at 1970 versus 2022 statistics. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's been a few different um, things that we inject in people that started in the 1970s. Yeah, so it's actually a pretty at, common cause of death in bodybuilders. Ar- arrhythmia is yeah. very common. Yeah, with the electrolyte manipulation and you're sort of setting the stage. I mean, a lot of them are already going to have ischemic heart disease. They just mm-hmm. don't know about it because the heart failure has not fully manifested mm-hmm. itself. But what I in actuality think is the main driving force, not the only driving force. The main driving force here is microplastics. Just kidding. That is, that could be contributing though. Um, certainly uh, cardiac amyloidosis can lead to a lot of arrhythmia and structural disease and microplastic accumulation might not be that dissimilar to systemic amyloidosis, which is just misfolded proteins. Whereas I think the real number one answer, again, not as exciting or sexy, is going to be that people are living longer after things that would normally kill them. The same reason why metformin leads to an increased incidence of dementia, this is kind of controversial too, but a lot of things that extend your lifespan will increase your chance of dementia. So if you don't die from a heart attack as early, you'll get more dementia, more electrical disease, more structural disease. Yeah, if you're, you know, uh, blessed enough and you live long enough and you dodge heart disease and cancer, like as umbrella terms, then generally you're looking at something like an accident or neurodegenerative as the cause of your demise. Mm-hmm. So I think if someone is wanting to check off boxes, heart health, the CCTA makes sense probably if you're north of 35, maybe younger in some cases. Um, you know, an echocardiogram is fairly cheap. And you may pick up some incidental things with these. You know, they're not zero risk tests. You're going to see some trace regurgitation that happens and doesn't really mean anything. So you have to think, is this person high health anxiety? Is this actually going to make their life better if we see something that doesn't matter? There are genetic tests you can do looking at predisposition to arrhythmias or structural heart issues. 
Um, and if you check those three boxes and control your blood pressure, control your blood sugar, control your blood, I'm going to say cholesterol levels, and all of the lipidologists will shame me, but controlling cholesterol levels for terms of simplicity, I think that's a pretty simple toolkit. And maybe, you know, I know the, the critics of the Maha movement are saying that, no, we don't need every American to have a wearable. Wearables have saved zero lives. I, I saw someone put this and I thought, yeah, just the number of patients I've had that have picked up AFib with like an Apple smartwatch. And, yeah. You know, I don't know that a glucometer on every single person, the CGM is going to have a huge impact, but... Especially not 365 days a year. <laughs> maybe maybe two weeks every year. Yeah, yeah. Get a gauge on, like, you probably pick up some diabetes cases that would otherwise slip through the cracks that way. But I, I think, like, the AFib detection on these smartwatches is, like, a big game changer in terms of preventing that AFib from contributing to mm -hmm. a stroke, right? A lot of people, they are not symptomatic in AFib. A lot of people are, but... Some mm -hmm. people are walking around right now, yep. they don't know that they're an AFib, and that could be pretty easily identified. Yeah, and another great time to promote individualized medicine. So in general, people shouldn't worry about what, you know, it's a public health thing. So this is what people like Dr. Taylor Martin think about and other uh, public health experts. And they're trying to inform clinical decision-making. That's what informatics is. But what each individual listening should think about, and when I worry about my individual health and you worry about your individual health, is what is your specific scenario and what test or intervention or supplement or whatever the intervention is, lifestyle intervention, should you do in order to have more benefit from a uh, morbidity and mortality, which means basically quality and quantity of life? And what are the potential downsides of all of those. Sure, yeah, you mentioned, you know, the uh, downsides, like the CCTA has radiation, echocardiogram, you know, it's it's non-invasive, it's an ultrasound, but there can still be some non-clinically meaningful results, but that's a couple hundred dollars. somebody's mental health. There's always yeah. a financial cost with these things. And I mean, the bulk of the population would do well to, you know, get into their primary care providers and get the recommended annual screenings, mm -hmm. I think utilization of that is quite low. Yep. You know, maybe less than 20% of people are checking all yep. those boxes. And although we love telemedicine, going to a healthcare provider in person that will actually listen to them, maybe do an EKG, maybe do some sort of wearable, maybe even do a Zio monitor, which is like a, a newer generation Holter monitor. Those things are very helpful. If you want to be an adult athlete, which I think everyone should find that movement pastime to last a lifetime, Think about what pediatric athletes need to do to do high school sports and college sports and professional sports. Most of them are getting at least a sports physical, going through the screening questionnaires for heart disease, red flags, and getting an EKG and or echo. Yeah, you just have to wonder about that with, you know, a lot of the um, male and female, but seemingly male athletes that have these mm -hmm. sudden cardiac deaths, probably an arrhythmia that we're seeing. and. You know, are all of them having a genetic testing? No. Are all of them having an echocardiogram? No. They're probably at least having a, like, like clinical exam with auscultation, listening to mm -hmm. the heart sounds. But I don't know that a lot of them are even getting an EKG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a good summary. I think that's really most of the takeaways that we have from this um, article that really made quite a few headlines. But if you think about it, it all just comes back down to the individualized medicine component. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, reclassification, not necessarily a huge shift in how we're managing risk. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of the same foundational lifestyle principles, a lot of the same pillars of health. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, if you have questions or comments about heart disease, specific things you'd like for us to talk through on the podcast, specific things you'd like for us to not talk about, because we've talked about heart disease a lot, then leave those things in the comments. Uh, we do uh, read those. Our media guy will curate and gather them and send them over to us. And as always, thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. May God bless you with health and happiness.